So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon, this evening, <laughs> in this event that we are hosting from the United Left Abroad. My name is Alicia Gaban. I'm co-responsible of uh, political communication. And um, today at the International uh, Migrants Day, we are hosting this event that is named International Left Bloc, organizing politics abroad with our sister organizations. I'm really glad to, to welcome the Democrat Socialists of America, the Polisario from uh, the Left Internationals from Germany, and also the Citizens Revolution, Citizens Revolution Movement from Ecuador, and ourselves, the United Left. So thank you all for sharing the screen with us. Um, before to get started, I would like to say just a few words about our organization, the United Left Abroad. It's a federation member of the Spanish political left party, Izquierda Unida, and we are based in different countries and we organize uh, globally our political action. Um, and But my colleague uh, Nerea will tell you a bit more about about this uh, later on. So, well, actually, I would like to introduce you, uh, Nerea. So, Nerea uh, will be our first speaker. She's the co chair of our political party in abroad, indeed. <laughs> uh, she's originally from Extremadura, Spain. Uh, she's currently based in Ireland, where she's an active member of the anti fascist movements and housing movement. And she recently joined the Sinn Fein political party. So, Nerea. Tell us a bit more about the United Left Abroad, the political struggles, and everything that you think that might be relevant today. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> The mic. Uh, thanks a million for being today with us and us. My colleague Alicia says, like today is the Migrants uh, National Day, so it's really good like we got together today. And well, just like go on and introduce you what do we do in our federation and why do we think it's important to the like, Spanish migrants to be or organized um, abroad. I'll just like to start a little bit with our history, because like actually our history has to, to be with the old immigration like the Spanish have to, to deal like in the 60s and 70s and actually to like the Republic immigration like our country has, you know, like with the civil war and the dictatorship, like a lot of people have to leave Spain um, for political reasons or like due to, to poverty. I, they most went to Latin America where until today their descendants are trying to get Get the Spanish citizenship, and actually, it's one of our goals in the federation. And we're like working in the bill, like the descendants law, because it's like the right as um, as like have like a Spanish uh, background. Um, our federation was created because I think what is our like goal and understanding that the context of migration, the Spanish migration, has changed, and it's very uh, variety. So we need like a structure to to get and unify all the migration because in the 60s and 70s during this second wave of migration like we had um different assemblies like in the communist party and it gave them abroad but it was like most like in france and belgium and switzerland so they were like separately and local uh, assemblies so four years ago uh, we thought that like, why not get this assembly is like abroad to this federation, like if Kerdanida abroad, like United Left abroad, where a large number of people like well migrated to place in particular and different workers as well, like a migrants worker who had to leave Spain. And actually the new my migrant uh, wave, it is like the 2010s uh, when this Spain left uh, has like this economical crisis so it's like the that kind of migration wave we are now like us and and um, so uh, the kind of migration we have in our federation like different people in background so that's what we thought it would be good just to get together as one federation and keep working in all the struggles we have half abroad. So most of us are located in the United Kingdom, Germany, France or Belgium 
and or also in Latin America, the United States, or even I have we, we have a few members in in Asia. Um, so do, this new internal structure not only brings the party federal structure closer to its members, but it allows people to join uh, the United Left approach, even when they live far away from where like the historical historical federations used to be established. That's why we have a global assembly to those these members who are not who don't have like a local based um, assembly like myself, for example. We don't have an assembly here in Dublin, so like my membership is with the global um, assembly as well. So our main challenge is like to make possible like every United Left member living abroad can collaborate in, in any organized manner, regardless of the city, country, or continent. Uh, sitting like this 16 base assemblies as well as creating new ones actually that's that's actually one of the goals like keep they like keep being bigger and create new uh, assemblies um and we also have like this goal of having members to get involved in industrial conflicts that affect migrants either by participating in existing activities networks or by creating new, new ones so we have local like as we organize yourself as is like in local assemblies. We have assemblies in Berlin, Brussels, two assemblies in Buenos Aires, because it's like really big. Buenos Aires is crazy. So we have two local groups there. We have Frankfurt, which is one of our oldest um, memberships um, members um, group. And actually they left most most of them left Spain during the, the political situation. And we have assemblies in Luxembourg, Toulouse, and Zurich as well, as well as our global assembly, as I said before. And this is like our local work where members are in touch with the local restaurant groups as well in their countries, but also contributing with the local struggle. And then we have the like the direction commission of the collegiate commission. Uh, this is conformed by joint uh, equally co coordinators or co-responsibles of uh, the different uh, struggles we have. We have a spokesperson and representation coordinator, which is my duty here in this federation with my colleague, Eduardo Velázquez. And we have organization and finance, political action, which I think in my opinion, is the most important, one of the most important parts of our federation because all the work we do, everything we're trying to 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 research of the or, that all that is, um, uh, work in their political action. And we have communication and media with its our uh, colleague Alicia, which is here today. And actually all our responsibilities must be necessarily be equal. That means like has to be a uh, one woman or uh, woman or two women we can't have two men because like uh we are like for in the institutes in Pierre Unida, we are like equally organization which so we have to be 50 50. um and also another um body how to say uh like another kind of group we have is the coordinator and commission of the federation uh, which is like the highest governing body of the federation and um, so what we are like we have the the members of the direction there in this coordinating commission and one representative for every uh, assemblies we have abroad so this is like, like um every time that like, we have to do we have to make a decision or like there's something important to do we have to debate it and um, are we in that group and that's like or main like that's the, the channel at which we have to in to do or to war it our goal like in the federation just like to to let you know is like to give voice and representation to all spanish immigration who are abroad since unfortunately migrants as you know have no rights nor in the countries of residence and nor in the countries of origin like in spain um i really like to to, I really like this quote from a uh, comrade from Maria Granate. Maria Granate is the Spanish migrant social movement. And she said, migrants are political orphans. We have no representation in our countries, are in the countries we live. 
So we live in like in a limbo. So our goal is to give that voice, that voice for like Spanish migrants in the Spanish institutions. Because like, for example, just to say a few things like it's going on uh, with the migrants uh, in Spain, with the Spanish migrants, sorry. We don't have the right to a fair electoral process in which many, like many times, the vote, we can't get access to vote in the um, state of uh, elections in Spain because like the system is not very fair or like the vote, we can't, the vote don't reach our um, addresses or they don't reach Spain as well. So we cannot vote in Spain and we cannot vote in the countries we live in because like we are not citizens of like the countries we we, we have our residents. Another problems we have is, for example, with our pensions. If we've been working abroad at the end of our working life, we want to return to to Spain. A lot of times we can't get access to a pension. Like for example, it happens to the Galician sailors of the Long Hope in Norway, and they are trying to get their their pension because they've been working in Norway for many years, but they can't. So that's one of our goals as well. And we reached that to this Spanish institution to represent all kind of people who are abroad. Or for example, another, as I said before with Latin America, like loads of people like grandparents and grandmothers had to immigrate from Spain for political reasons or due to poverty and to Latin America, but their descendants doesn't have have their Spanish citizenship. So this is one of our main work as well. Or for example, like in the Netherlands, we have this open, um, um, how to say, the struggle where it's like many times they're trying to look for Spanish workers in this kind of countries that are like richer than us. So a lot of people are trying to, they, they go to the Netherlands or another kind of countries. And but they, like when they get there, they get offered like zero countries hours. So like they're in debt with these companies and they're, when they're trying to leave and go back to Spain, they can't because they can't broke the contract. So that's kind of things and like what we're working in our federation. So we have to localize problems of the, the Spanish workers in abroad or like au pairs or any kind of situation and trying to reach us to our institutions. Um, just like to, to say as well, like, of course, like we have another struggles, but this is like the main reasons we're working in. And just to mention like our federation is not institutional at all. We're simply like a small federation with in a political party is Izquierda Unida. There is actually currently in a coalition government where we are a minority, but we work like tirelessly to bring the voice of immigration to the institutions. All our work is completely voluntary. We have like our normal jobs, like eight, nine hours a day. And then when we go home, we are always like in meetings or trying to, to reach this um, works to and different problems to the institutions and it's like a tremendous pride for me to represent a federation where our members are such commitment comrades we have very clearly our goals are our ideology we work so that migrant workers have rep representation and do not feel abandoned by the state that has actually abandoned us, but we will continue to fight to improve the lives of migrant workers and the no one has had to leave Spain or their home. First, very situation that and in Spain in the late um, years. So I think that I'll finish with this because otherwise I'll keep talking and I want to listen to actually, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Nerea. I would like to recall uh, the people who is watching us that you can write your questions in the Facebook chat box. So you are very welcome to address any questions to our participants today. And also I would like to recall that our website, our Izquierda uh, Unida Exterior United Left at Broad uh, website is translated into Italian, English, French, German, and our 
country national languages. So if you are interested, you can have a look at the website and get more information about this. I'll, let's move now to the US, well, <laughs> virtually and from Berlin. Uh, so let me introduce to Ted. Ted is a member of the Democratic Socialists of America in Berlin, and that was uh, originally named uh, Germany for Bernie. So I think it's uh, a really interesting participant as well, because we are in a particular moment where what happened in US and the electoral process just conclude. So I would like that Ted, you introduce us a bit what you are working on right now and how was all how, how you organize actually in Berlin. So thank you Ted, for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so so like you said, you know, we we started out as Germany for Bernie, a group of a group of people all obviously trying to campaign to help get um, Bernie Sanders elected in the you know, first in the democratic primary and so that was you know for for several months we were doing a lot of um, a lot of phone banking text banking you know other kind of get out the vote activities really tied directly to that electoral process um in doing so we have you know you you develop a group you develop a community we do events and so on and, and partner with local groups and then um you know that's all happening in parallel with it with this electoral process and then obviously you know that that didn't go how we wanted, um, you know. Starting in about about March, when things started to look bad, right when the pandemic's hitting, so sort of faced this this dual problem of like, okay, this like electoral goal we've been working for seems to be slipping out of reach, and also we can't really like meet up to to do very much um, to create an alternative or alternative kinds of uh, activism, and so you know we as a group we we decided wh where to go from there and what to do. Um, you know, it didn't have, there was nothing like preordained about us choosing to become Democratic Socialists of America group, but we had a lot of people who were active in their groups from back in the U.S. And it's a, it's a very, it's a growing organization. Um, you know, it's the, the largest socialist group in America, um, pushing, you know, um, coming up on about 100,000 members now, and that's up from, you know, uh, like 5,000 a few years ago. So this, there's really been astronomical growth with this group, I think. A lot in part due to to Bernie Sanders popularizing a lot of the ideas of democratic socialism, and so we saw a lot of potential for that as both a, an organization we believed in and a, a kind of recognizable brand for um, Amer both both Americans who are moving abroad and want to stay involved, and also um, you know because of obviously the the size of the U.S. and the influence and the fact that we're, you know, either bombing or sanctioning half the world at any given point in time. Um, a lot of foreigners also want to be involved in American politics. And so um, it, it's, a, it's a way for, for sort of both of those tasks to be accomplished, right? Um, like a starting point for, for U.S. citizens moving abroad, um, also a way to get involved in U.S. politics, both electorally and in terms of education. Like one of the, we've done some events, we're going to do reading groups in the future. Um, you know, get involved in that, both for citizens and non-citizens, um, and also partnering with local groups, which I think we'll get into later. That's another another big part of our goal is um, is making sure that it's not just we're not just a sort of an expat club of Americans, right? It's a it's a way to build bridges and make connections with local left movements. And you know, in terms of in terms of what we do, you know, obviously it started out of an electoral movement, so there's there's a bit of I guess electoralism in the DNA of, of the group, if you will, but that's obviously not, you know, not all, and probably not even most of, of what we should be doing. And so, you know, we've continued, we continue to stay involved in the electoral process um, through the election campaigning in the, both the primaries and the general for other progressive candidates um, like Jamal Bowman, uh, Mashida Tlaib, and so on. And so, trying to trying to make sure we can have. Um, the U.S. Congress be as progressive as possible. And, you know, there there were some some victories there, some disappointments as well. But um, you know, trying trying to get as many people that agree with us in office as possible was really important. Obviously, now you know the electoral season is is dying down, um, especially after these these Georgia races. Um, and you know, from then on, we want to build more into uh, educational work. I think is really important. And, and like I said, also partnering with with local groups. But you know, we do in the future. Um, you know, there's always another election around the corner, and so like we will stay active in that in terms of getting out the vote. I mean, because Americans abroad tend to be uh, very progressive um, relatively, because you know you 
for an American that doesn't have like education costs fifty thousand dollars a year, you don't get healthcare. And then for us in Germany, all of a sudden, you know, you, you you have a couple of those things, and Germany's by no means a paradise, but there's a few just kind of basic social democratic things that that it has that that we don't have in the U.S. And so I think it it makes those those ideals that, that Bernie Sanders campaigned on and like key tenets of democratic socialism very appealing. And so it has a Americans abroad tend to be. Um, very progressive. I think average in 2016 and 2020, about two thirds of the vote in the Democratic primary went to Bernie Sanders. Um, so huge figures. And there's estimates that there's about 9 million Americans living abroad, only 4% of them vote. And so there is this big untapped progressive resource that we want to, to utilize more um, and, and get involved in the electoral process You know, when, when that time comes around. And in the meantime, getting involved with local movements, local groups, and keeping up the education going. So uh, those, are, those are sort of the main areas we work on. And actually, you are in Berlin, uh, but uh, I guess there are several groups in different countries, and you are coordinate, or, or you just work solo? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I should, um, thanks for bringing that up. That's something that we've been really active in as well. We were, especially with the group in the UK, um, who were, there was a, UK for for Bernie group, somewhat somewhat similar. I mean, it sort of everything sprung up organically because everyone was so enthusiastic. But then we ended up making contacts with these other groups, and so they made the the same decision to try to um, to establish a DSA chapter abroad. And these are the first two um, international groups of DSA um, that have been in existence at all. And so we worked really closely with them, coordinating with the national DSA. Um, you know, we coordinate with them on events and so on, but also the kind of logistical process of of setting up a group um, abroad and and how to how to stay active with that. So yeah, we're we're in close contact with um, people all really all around the world. I mean, there's people you know, Australia, throughout Europe, um, some in South America that have contacted us and and want to sort of learn how they can establish a similar group. And so we yeah, it's also you know building bridges between different DSA chapters as well as local groups. So there's a, it's a lot of a lot of work to be done there, but that's a big part of what we do as well. So thank you so much because it's, uh, I mean, we, we, we have um, some members of our party are living as well in US and they are in touch with the Democratic Socialists of America group the, over there. So we, we follow as well their activities. Um, right. So just, just stress, yeah, you don't, you don't need to be a US citizen to be involved in, mm, in DSA yeah. at all. They're, they're open to anyone from any nationality. So mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, don't, it's not, not an exclusionary thing just because there's the country's name mm -hmm. in the title. Yeah. So I guess you are on Facebook and you have a like a, as well a website where people can get more information if you want to, I guess. Yeah, we have the Twitter um, and we have the, the sign up form um, on there. Great. So yeah, so, yeah to encourage yeah. our audience if they are, they want more information on how to join or how to participate. We yeah. OK, great. Perfect. So thank you, Ted. I will get back to you in a second. But now I'm, I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to give the floor to Salka. Salka is a member of the Polisario Front from the Western Sahara. So thank you, Salka, for being with us this afternoon. Um, I would like to say on behalf of my party that you know that we are really close to your cause and you are supporting uh, the cause in the institutions, in the street. I mean, I'm wearing like a Freedom for the Sahara t-shirt, so you know that we are with with uh, you. Um, for those who don't know, uh, most of the Saharawian people are living in exile since 1976. They are living either in Argelian territories or uh, under the Moroccan occupation and also across the wall as Salka that she's living currently in Spain. So please Salka now explain us a bit what is the, the fight and the advocacy that you are uh, going carrying on these days and please <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your support and thank you for giving me the chance to talk about Western Sahara and the Saharawi conflict. Um, the, I'm going to start with uh, explaining a little bit about uh, the history in case uh, someone doesn't know exactly. Well, Western Sahara is uh, used to be the um, Spanish colony and after the Spanish uh, Spanish government decided to leave Western Sahara, didn't do really its job to decolonize properly the territory of Western Sahara. 
So since then and after the Moroccan uh, government invaded uh, the territory of Western Sahara, we, we have been struggling for independence and uh, fighting for it everywhere, not only in uh, Western Sahara and occupied Western Sahara or in the refugee camps that were created uh, later on. Uh, but everywhere, and the diaspora is everywhere. We have uh, organizations in um, the European Union, and we have in the US and South America and Asia. We have uh, everywhere. Sahara always go everywhere, but the cause always lives with them. Um, the Polisario Front is the um, is the in its capacity as a national liberation movement is the sole um, and legitimate representative of the people of Western Sahara. And it's in accordance with the international law in the UN resolutions. It defends the, um, the right of the Sahrawi people to, uh, to self-determination and to be able to freely, um, to opt freely for independence or whatever the alternative for they choose. So meanwhile, um, where more myself, there are many people who live abroad and um, organize events and organize uh, NGOs and be part of all of this for Western Sahara. Uh, the majority of the people are under the Moroccan occupation in the occupied territories of Western Sahara or in the refugee camps in, in South uh, West uh, Algeria. Uh, both of the both the both of the people fight uh, in their ways for the independence, but um, I have to mention that the people under the Moroccan occupation suffer daily abuses in uh, f uh, any human right uh, they have. They're violated every day, and there is an absolute absence of the uh, media and the international observers since the United Nations mission to Western Sahara, the MINORS, was the only mission of the UN uh, that doesn't include um, human rights uh, monitoring. So we struggle with the, with that. We they don't have freedom of movement. They don't have freedom of uh, speech. Uh, anything they do, they are. Um, attacked and they are incarcerated they are um, anything you can think of and another on the other hand the people who live in the refugee camps live on uh, international help which it's ironic because western sahara is one of the richest country natural resources but its population lives on um, international aid um, meanwhile morocco the moroccan occupation um, ex uh, it's um, Sent, uh, stealing the natural resources of Western Sahara and selling it to the mo uh, majority European countries. While the European countries each and uh, each year they decrease um, the interna international aid that goes to the refugee camps. So they help or they um, they continue helping uh, the occupation, the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara, and stealing the natural resources, while they are telling the refugee camp, uh, the refugees, the Sahrawi refugees, that they can no longer help them the amount that they were helping them the year before. Yeah, so it's it's a, a constant struggle for us, and um, the Polisario Front uh, continues to um, organize events internationally, organize, uh, it's, it works with the NGOs, uh, associations, um, everywhere, not only um, in the refugee camps or in occupied territories, but also abroad in every country that it's present. Thank you, Salka, for, for such a great um, introduction and, and for putting the spotlight in the Western Sahara that is something really important and even more with the recent events that are happening right now. So we are looking quite closely what is happening over there and we are really worried about the 
scale of events, right? Yeah, that that's a, a thing that I I have I didn't mention yet is mm -hmm. uh, after thirty years of ceasefire agreements because the war started in nineteen seventy five uh, between uh, West the Polisario Front and uh, the Moroccan occupation and it went on until uh, ninety one when the UN intervened and promised the people of Western Sahara self determination and that we would be able to um, decide on our future. And since 1991 until today, that uh, self-determination never happened. That process of uh, deciding on our future never happened. And uh, 29 years later, the Moroccan occupation decides once again to violate international law and to attack peaceful protesters in the Gergadat zone. Uh, and to intervene, and the Polisario then de decided to intervene because they saw that if they didn't intervene, those peaceful protesters will be killed, like many others in occupied territories. Uh, and since then, we the, we have decided to go back to war, and it's since uh, November thirteenth we have been at war, a war that obviously not the international media is not interested in, and the Morocco keeps um, denying, even though they had already felt. Um, the consequences of it, and um, we continue. This is, this war, from my perspective, we we gave the international community and the United Nations enough time to fulfill the promise, and they didn't. So it's it's time to go back to uh, the armed struggle and fight for what is ours. Indeed, indeed. And uh, it's really sad that you have to come to the war, but there is things that you cannot really stand for any more time. Um, I maybe would like to ask just a final question to you. How are the people? Are you in contact with, with them? And maybe just if you want to say a word about this as well. Yeah, we have a constant, constant contact with uh, Every Saharawi uh, have a member of its family that went brothers, uh, uncles, fathers, and uh, not even only the men, the women are in the front line too, because as you know, the Polisario Front is formed with men and women, and we are both in the diplomatic area, but also in the front line of every uh, battle. Um, right now, I, I do have members of my family there, and... Um, yeah, we have contact with them. The moral is really high. We, it's not a war that we asked for or we went looking for, but it's it's been welcomed because we have had enough time in struggling under the Moroccan occupation and struggling in refugee camps. So it's really nobody goes asking for war, but this war is it's needed. Thank you, Salka. We we are keeping an eye on that on it and it indeed. So now I'm going to to move to Latin America with Jorge. Jorge is a member of the Citizen Revolution Movement from Ecuador. He's also a former consul uh, in, in London while uh, President Correa was in administration. So. Um, and you are now facing as well an electoral process that is taking place in February. So please, Jorge, could you please introduce a bit what is the Citizen Revolution Movement? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity with all of you. Um, well, I would like to do um, a little bit of uh, history of um, what uh, our movement is because it's um it's a political project it's not only a political movement that is started by by rafael correa the the former uh, president of ecuador in 2006. um ecuador was um uh, was in an economical and social crisis by the time um, in 10 years we have um we had uh, seven presidents so um, uh, after this crisis, uh, President Correa de decided to, fo to form this uh, movement called um, uh, Citizens Revolution. And um, many, many political movements gathered together to gain uh, power. So after this, um, the president started um, 
decided to to call for a referendum for a new um, uh, for a new constitution, which was approved in two thousand and nine. So in this constitution, um, they it was established uh, a new uh, new concept, two new uh, concepts or principles. One of them is human being of a capital and the other one um, focus on um, on migrants that no one is illegal so under those principles um the the new constitution was um was adapted even um to give a uh, right to ecuadorian citizens abroad but also to give a uh, right to ecuadorians who are in ecuador and also to the environment it gives rights to the water it gives right, uh, right to to the land, so it's it's, it's, it's very extensive. So regarding the, the Ecuadorian mi migrants, uh, we we had um, political rights abroad as well. So uh, with this constitution, they, uh, it was established uh, three circumscriptions. Um, one of them is uh, the US and Canada. The other one, Latin American countries, and the third circumscription is in Europe. So we are based in Europe and um, we organize the, the, the political movement. Even though we are in Europe, we are, this political movement is in the US as well, in Canada and, all, uh, and most of the Latin American countries. So we elect two members of the parliament uh, with, um, uh, on, the, uh, on one of these uh, each circumscriptions. And uh, we have this uh, general election coming up that, uh, now in February. And um, yeah, under these uh, circumstances, uh, we are basically uh, in the middle of the campaign. Uh, the official campaign starts on the 31st of um, December, that it goes until the, the, um, seven, uh, the 7th of February, when is the election day. So um, the, 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 this political project is, um, it goes it goes beyond the um, only the uh, political uh, activity itself is to empower people to empower Ecuadorian citizens to to participate to engage in in, politi in, in politics but not only in Ecuadorian politics also to engage in in uh, in those countries where where we live for example there is a um, there is a massive migration in in Spain after the crisis in, 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 in 1999, when there was um, a bank bailout. So this these bailout was, uh, was uh, induced by, uh, by someone who is candidate for president now from, uh, from the right wing. So, um, so it's, it's, it's completely... Um, the, we are preoccupied because these kind of people they want to gain power. So because after they did, so you can imagine what they can do if they gain power. So um, that's why we, as migrants, and as we mobilized, we um, we reorganized the movement because um, the the current president Lenin Moreno he won um, he won power with our movement. However. After after we won, he um, um, he left the, the the political project, the, the uh, citizen revolution, and he um, he had us political allies, all the all the right wing parties, and he um, he did completely opposite to to uh, to what we vote for. So um, he he started to privatize in uh, all the all the political all the poli all the public services, and uh, also um, also start uh, um, start um, a, a political persecution to all the all the opposition leaders in this case to our um, our political movement. So um, under these circumstances, it was very difficult to reorganize back in 2006, 17, and 18. However, we did, and we are um, we are now back in um, back in the political arena. And we are fighting uh, because um, we, in these last four years, 
we the president has destroyed everything um all the infrastructure all the public services um all the all the services that, uh, for migrants abroad so it's it's um it's a, it's a huge challenge because uh we fight against the the government uh, he has all these um, all these systematic uh, abuse against uh, our leaders and uh, our um, our members of, of our political party and allies, and also um, is um, the electoral um, council is uh, is also putting many blockades for us to participate. So President Correa um, was persecuted and um, they didn't allow to uh, to participate in the last election. So they rushed into the judicial, uh, judiciary system to, to give him a sentence that sometimes it takes like two years so uh, he was sentenced in in 17 days so that so you can see all the persecution that that we had also the the ex vice president that that won with um, with lenin moreno he was accused of corruption without any proof of um, of substantial proof and he's basically a political prisoner in in ecuador so as I said, so because um, despite of this blockade, we are we are organized uh, again in, in in Europe. We have um, the the citizen revolution movement. The, the the president of the movement is Rafael Correa he, he himself, and uh, we have um, we have members of, in in nine countries right now, and uh, and we are. Um, uh, we are starting new ones in in another countries um we basically is um so every we created these uh, collectives that they have um a minimum of 20 members so those those collectives in those countries they 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 form a committee in in each country and uh, there there is also a european committee where i am member of that european committee as well so we have uh, we have members um, we have committees in Spain, Italy, the United Kingdom, Belgium, France, Germany, Sweden, Russia, and uh, other countries as well. So um, the, the the other part is um, uh, we uh, we try to engage in, in local in local politics. And one of those examples is is Margarita Guerrero, who is part of the of of the United uh, Left in, in Spain. And um, she is from Ecuador. She came here as a migrant, um, and then she got engaged in politics, and and she was uh, a councillor in Murcia. And now she is a candidate for the Ecuadorian Assembly as um, um in, for for europe so this is um i think this these are the results of the of the um, political engagement and motivation that um that president korea gave us to to us to, as a migrant and uh, we are um, we are participating everywhere so uh, the, we have all the councils in london as well um with the labor country, with the labor party and uh, many of the many of the ecuadorians are participating in in different um in different areas mainly in spain because we have a, a large amount of um of migrants in in spain but um we are we are there and uh, we will soon start the 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 political campaign um, and uh, we we think and we think to strongly believe that we will win because we are first in polls however it's it's a difficult it's a difficult time because of the, the of the pandemic and um, difficult to to campaign as well um, thank you, Jorge. Uh, I would like to send maybe uh, some regards to Margarita because actually she, she made the bridge in between us and she gave us the contact and we, we work quite closely with her as well. But I would like to ask you, um, what are actually the, the main demands from the uh, Equatorian people living abroad that you are like um, bringing into the campaign right now? Maybe just a few of them you can mention them? Yeah, the main the main ones are um, basically um, 
is is to give um be, because we and the and the and the, the previous government we have these uh, services uh, consular services to um to migrants so all all those uh, services were dismantled by the by the current government the many uh, many many uh, consulates were closed so all those citizens they they not able to to access to some services so the the, the, the first idea is is to gain power because um if we win the, the government we will um we will reinstate those services to migrants and one of the the, the first one is um access to work i mean access to education that's why we we work with uh, local poli uh, local politicians with uh, political parties in every country because um because we live in different countries so sometimes uh, well it's, it's not possible for ecuador to provide education in, in, in those countries that's why we engage in this in these activities with you with you in this case and other political movements to um um to push for those for those public uh, services or those public policies in 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 those countries and um one other area that we we've been working on is um also with the unions i mean workers unions to protect those those rights for those for those workers in those countries um and uh, get a uh, um a fair contract a fair salary uh, rights access to rights to education itself and and protect the right so this is these are one of um, our main um they had been one of our main objectives but also uh, to provide support to all the vulnerable people that uh, we we had in europe as well because of this pandemic many people are without work so we're trying to um if, well, if we were in the power and um, managing the consulates and the and the diplomatic um uh, uh, services, uh, we will be able to to provide more and more um, uh, support for them. However, this is being dismantled, and uh, we are in, in in the way to get to get them back. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jorge, for mentioning the this is is really relevant, and also it's really relevant for us as a political party abroad because we are studying as well there how we can get the representation of uh, in our national congress of our migrants. So we are looking uh, closely as well to the example of Ecuador, and well, we we are in touch with Margarita to see how we can work on that as well. So thank you for bringing up that event, that um, that fact as well. Um, now I'm moving to Germany with Hannah. <laughs> Hi, Hannah. Um, Hannah is a member of the Left International. That is a group inside of the Linke, the left political party in Germany, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, she's going to introduce but uh, now. And uh, they are integrating actually non-German citizens into the German politics. So I think it's a really quite interesting uh, group that I'm uh, looking forward to learning more about it. So please, Hannah, thank you. Hi, thank you, Alisa. Thank you for having me or us today. Um, so yeah, that's right. We at uh, Dlinke International, so the Left Internationals, is a working group of the German Left Party in Berlin. Um, and what I guess what we try to do is kind of international solidarity in practice. So we try to bring together various quite disparate migrant groups um, or just migrants who are not connected to any group and introduce them to the kind of left uh, activist scene in Berlin. Um, and we work in English, which I know is not for everybody. Well, it's the most democratic language we could think of for migrants in Berlin. Um, and in Berlin, I think I think it's now about 25% of the population that is not a German citizen that lives in the city. So it's a really huge number of people. Obviously, a lot of people are involved in various political struggles, but um, that what we've been finding is that they have been quite separate from each other and they have and kind of uh, country based kind of nation state based and so what we try to do is bring those quite dis disparate groups together um, in various ways um, so we have a monthly meeting what we call a meeting but they're kind of panel discussions usually or presentations where we try to amplify or talk about a certain struggle 
um, somewhere in the world. Um, and we invite in representatives from those countries or from various groups um, who deal with these issues to talk and present their perspective. So it's, we kind of try and use the platform that we have to allow, um, to well, to let people find out about what's going on. Um, so we, we've had various ones. I think our last one was on um, the pro-choice, uh, pro-choice lobbying on the far right, uh, sorry, anti-choice lobbying on the far right, where we had speakers talk about um, the situation, the kind of links between the USA, Brazil, and Poland in that context. Um, so there's a kind of thing we try to do. We kind of try to make them more and more thematic and bring the groups together. Um, Another thing that we do is the group uh, has a website called The Left Berlin, uh, theleftberlin.com, which has now become quite independent from the working group. Uh, initially, it was the website for the group, but now it functions separately and is even less linked with the party. Um, so, But the idea of that is to have uh, English language left articles, news, um, both to inform people about what's going on in Berlin politically, but also to kind of inform Berliners in English about what's going on around the world. So we kind of, so the website kind of has this two-way um, system, let's say. Um, we also, every year, once a year, organize kind of a get-together for various activist groups or activists um, where we call it like a summer camp and we get together for two days and kind of present different groups there to kind of allow people to find out what's going on in Berlin, what kind of thing we've been focusing on in that year and to kind of uh, make connections. And we basically try, what we really try to do is to make connections between people um, who perhaps might find it quite difficult to get into the activist scene in Berlin, especially if German is not the first language, because um, let's say that the German activist scene can be quite impenetrable <laughs> or quite difficult to get into. Um, just because their structures are quite uh, specific. Um, so that's the kind of thing we do. We are funded by the party. Uh, we are linked with the party. We are allowed to send um, delegates to party conferences. We are allowed to send in motions if we want or sign motions of the party, but we are also quite independent. Like our funding does, we do apply for funding every year, but the party kind of lets us get on with what we uh, want. And that's never really been, uh, we've rarely had issues. Um, I before going into what issues we've had. But um, what else do we do? We, I think that's kind of it. We, we effectively try to make it easier to get involved in politics. For, pe for people who have who come to Berlin, it's sometimes it's quite overwhelming knowing what's going on, both in kind of on the Berlin German level and also in terms of various groups and what the struggles here are. And there's just, there's something happening here every day so we kind of try and channel that and kind of become a very a kind of a central information point um, for people who are here who want to get involved in politics I remember you know going to my very first meeting and it's it's quite intimidating if you've never done something like this before so we also try to make things more open and uh, we have plans to make that, that even more open for the next year um, if it works out to kind of try and bring this community more together and um, I guess really start putting international solidarity into practice rather than just talking about it. And also the kind of thing that we do is we uh, try to organize blocks or kind of uh, get people together to go to demonstrations, um, to support different kind of groups. We get, if the party ever wants a speaker about any topic that we more often than not do have a contact from somebody from that activist group about whatever global struggle they are in that moment wanting to talk about. Um, we try to kind of bridge the gap between German politics and kind of migrant organizing. So uh, if people want to have in in some way they want to get to the party and talk to somebody in the party or the um, the foundation that's linked to the party, the Rose Luxemburg Foundation, we do try and facilitate that as well when we, whenever we can. Um, yeah, I guess that, I guess that's what we do. <laughs> No, but I was, uh, while I was getting ready for this event, I was reading the website and I found it uh, like a quite, quite really, really interesting, uh, um, I wouldn't say experiment, but the working group, that is something that other political organizations should look at because um, integrating uh, m migrants that way in the political party, I think is, is amazing. I, I really like it. I mean, so. <laughs> yeah, we try our best. It's not. I wouldn't say that we are also 
I would say the group itself, the working group, is not that integrated mm. in the party. Like we have mm. connections with the party, and mm. we we can we, maybe we could be more integrated, and we will probably do some. Uh, there's elections coming up next year, and EU citizens can vote mm. in on the local level. So we we'll probably will do kind of a campaign around that. But we are also are, we are kind of quite in between the two, the party and the kind of activist scene. So which is is quite nice. We can we can kind of do whatever we want. <laughs> I mean, this is why it's nice because we can get people come to us with ideas. We're usually very happy to facilitate them. Like we're not, the structure is very open and I hope quite welcoming. So um, we always try to kind of get new ideas, new people on board to see what is they need, what the kind of, what the people actually, what the migrants really need in this, from what, from us and from the scene and what is missing. So that's kind of, yeah. <laughs> I know that, for instance, uh, members of our assembly, local assembly in Berlin, they are collaborating as well, and members of uh, the left international in Berlin as well. Yeah, so. I know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, well, we have a really, uh, it, it might seem like we are from different uh, parts of the world, but actually our struggle when we are talking and we are raising examples is kind of similar. Uh, because we are facing now such, so much changes and we are seeing how as well the, the right, the, the hate speech is a bit uh, raging and polluting a bit media. So it's, it's nice to see how many initiatives are across the world that they are kind of working in the same direction, in the good direction, human rights uh, as well, because for me, kind of the left is <laughs> human rights based, let's say. And uh, well, I, I would like to raise a second question um, and then I will go to the audience. So I ask uh, the audience that they send more questions if they have. Um, I would like to know a bit how you are building um, and you are working with other organizations and how you are building uh, your your alliance with parties or organizations, as you were mentioned before, Hannah. So, um, uh, Hannah, maybe you can explain us a bit what you are doing uh, with other local movements. Um, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I've said some of it already, but yeah, well, <laughs> that's yeah, but, but, but more specifically. Yeah. So, what we try to do is that every month we have kind of a meeting that focuses on a particular theme or a particular struggle. So then we often try to find a, a group um, or an activist group, unless if, if we don't already know them, we try to find a group that will be able to speak. So say we were, um, when we were finding speakers for the last event that we did, which was uh, about uh, anti-abortion uh, far-right lobbying, then we, you know, we spoke to a Polish group, which um, I happen to be also part of, and we spoke to DSA in Berlin actually to provide a speaker, and we asked somebody to provide speak to find us a speaker that can talk about Brazil. So the the thing about our group is that, well, first of all, you don't have to be a party member to be in it, and most of us I think aren't. Um, actually, I don't know what the numbers are, and it's kind of irrelevant. And most of us are also in some other group. Um, so I am also in a Polish queer feminist group on the side of that. So we kind of try, so in that way, we kind of bring the groups together anyway, because it's quite rare that somebody in our group, uh, our group could be a stepping stone to uh, being, getting involved with others as well, because we try to try to make those connections. But there also could be that people from other activist groups come to us for various events. And that's how we also connect, because a lot of us have kind of different uh, work, uh, kind of are active in different contexts. So. Um, so one thing is these panels that we do. One thing is that when we try to um, talk about a certain issue on for the website, for example, um, we also try to find speakers in that way. So we also reach out to various groups for that. Um, we try to facilitate meetings whenever we can. Whenever there's an idea that comes up, then we, well, we, well, we try to find people. We go to demonstrations and talk to people. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's fine. No worries. I don't want to yeah, pressure you. And it's it's I think I don't want to repeat myself. Yeah, so. no, it's, it's okay. But that's kind of the thing we do. Yeah, it's fine. Um, what about uh, you, Jorge? Um, how, how do you? Yeah, do you go ahead, please, Salka, if the, you want. They actually participated in the protest, the peaceful protest that we organized uh, in Berlin last month. Mm -hmm. And um, your party was there. Yeah, your group, um, some of the group members participated with us. So thank you. Yeah, 
right. Yeah, no, that's what we exactly. That's kind of what we weren't trying yeah. to do. We also try to tell our kind of network the platform that we have. We try to use to tell people about what's going on, what kind of demonstrations are happening, to kind of shed light or like focus the light on uh, struggles that maybe are being kind of underrepresented in that particular at that particular time. So we exactly. We had people at that demonstration, and I know that we did a bit of promotion of that. We do a lot of work also on um, Palestine, for example, which is quite difficult in this context. So, um, yeah, we do try to do that. So, Salka, as you take the floor, maybe you want to explain how the Front Polisario is coordinating with other organizations abroad and building alliance, maybe? Sure. Yeah, well, we have organizations, um, for example, here in Europe, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have, uh, uh, we work uh, directly with NGOs, with uh, political parties like Izquierda Unida, uh, like um, Die Linke in, uh, in Berlin as well. Um, we have direct contact with many of them. We have organizations, institutions that we work directly with and uh, we basically everywhere we are we tend to um to connect right away with the people around us and create that uh like like uh, in spain we have each town has a small association that will connect with a bigger one and then therefore to a non-profit organization and they all connect and they all uh, work together for doing peaceful uh, protests, for example, doing uh, recollecting food for refugees, uh, sending um, medical supplies. And also uh, when it comes to voting, they do campaigns uh, pro uh, West, the cause of Western Sahara, pro Polisario. And uh, that's actually, we have the, the biggest issue here, for example, in Spain that is every campaign every um year or every election year we have these uh, political party parties that will promise us uh that will stand with us and that they will fulfill the promise and they will push for the un to fulfill the promise of self-determination and once they get to power they tend to forget about us because uh um, morocco just uh Every time anybody mentions or any political party mentions the uh, Western Sahara or the conflict in Western Sahara, they tend to uh, open the, their borders to illegal immigration and um, to uh, drug trafficking and all of that. And all of a sudden, no, no political parties uh, in power want to mention Western Sahara in fear of what Morocco is going to do. So they basically... Um, uh, the occupation blackmails every uh, political party that comes to um, the power or but it's a it's a continuous struggle to actually find a political party uh, party that will stick to its uh, promises like right now the political party in charge in Spain or in the government they promised that we have recorders, we have, everybody knows their stand in Western Sahara and they promised, uh, they made many promises to Sahrawi people and once they got in power, they are silenced. They they have no words uh, into, or no means, uh, fear, fear of the blackmail of Morocco and fear of what's, what can Morocco do to, um, to the economy or to the illegal immigration or but this is a struggle that we also have in um that the police area has in in western sahara for example we stop the illegal immigration in the liberatory territories that's uh, a zone that no illegal immigration no drug trafficking is occurring in the un is well aware of that um and there is a wall that actually it's separating one area uh, from Western Sahara to the another one uh, to the other part and there is no the only breach that connects uh, the occupied territories and Mauritania for example um, is the Gergadat zone and it's an active war right now so we get to this question how is Morocco uh, letting illegal immigration exit Morocco if no illegal immigration is actually coming to occupied territories of Western Sahara or the Moroccan territory. 
So it's a clear, it's clear that Morocco brings these people uh, who are struggling and um, wanting a better future for themselves, and they let them come into the Moroccan territory with a promise that they later on will go to Europe or have a better life, and that they use them as um, a currency. They, they use them to blackmail the European Union. And then they blame the Western Sahara for what's happening. So it's a, it's a tricky game with them. Mm. But yeah, with the political organizations uh, in Europe, we are, we are um, in any country that we live in and we participate in, we're active. Mm. Uh, so what about you, Jorge? Thank you for your words. Uh... Salka. <laughs> um, well, um, back in 2006 or so seven, when the uh, the previous government, the citizen revolution, started, and I started working for the Ecuadorian government in in London and the United Kingdom, we started to organizing um, people. I mean, Ecuadorians in different areas, like creating or um, associations, organizations of uh, maybe with different hobbies, maybe sports or cultural um, groups and uh, also community groups or the groups that they were associated to, um, to unions and um, after that we start building a kind of Ecuadorian network first and then those organizations started um, linking to um, other unions and also to um, to political um, to political movements and um, uh, and all uh, all the NGOs as well that um, they work with migrants or in, in, in different fields, and um, and that um, and that strategy also uh, worked in in Spain, uh, working with uh, local uh, councils, uh, with the mayors, uh, with the migrant organizations, and uh, and then uh, from there they. They merged, um, emerged um, different um, different candidates. Our for e even for our assembly, so um, it was um, yeah, it was it was um, it was a process uh, to get to this stage where we are now, and um, yeah, in different in different countries we we have more uh, more links uh, in other layers because of the number of Ecuadorians. But um, in general, uh, yeah, we also created links with other Latin American um, organizations in, in the UK, in France, or, or in, in Spain, in Germany. So we work together with them as well. Okay, thank you. Um, what about uh, United Left, uh, Nerea? And then I, I, I will go with that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. Actually, like I have to admit, like this question is like my favorite in the panel because um, inter internationalism and solidarity are values that we have very present in our federation and in in the left as well. Our members in in Izquierda Unida in sorry, in United Left Abroad, not only participate in our federation as members, with like, with having an eye, uh, having an eye in Spain and our struggles as migrants, but also many of us are very connected with our countries of residence, that we're very involved in the local struggles here, like in the countries we, we live in, obviously, like for like, obviously reasons, and we have created links and bonds with local movements uh, or with our sister parties um, of the left. Uh, just to mention, like, for example, like the work we do is like, it's amazing. So we have loads of people just working in the local um, grassroots movements or parties, for example, in Chile, just like to, to say we had uh, a very good presence with our congress there, like Hector Puyos. Um, he was the president of the National Coordinator of Immigrants in Chile, where they were fighting to, 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 to keep like the, to say to the Chilean government, you know, it's like very right when uh, like immigrants are, are like citizens of full right 
and recognize the, the, their citizenship there in, in Chile. And then also um, during the process in, in Chile, um, or, or Comra was sent, uh, and we had connections with all the struggle there in Chile, thanks to, to him. So in Chile, like, we, they need us to do or, or support to do any event or whatever they needed. Uh, we were there. Uh, and also as well, like for example, in Argentina or like another country where our members or like for example, La Lorca, where it's where the descendants of Republican meet and they have meetings and they are connected to each other so like we have that connect and for example in the USA um, as Alicia said before and maybe I'd like to know but we have um, as well like members working where with the campaign for Bernie uh, and um, Alexandra um, Casa Cortez and so that kind of things like we are losing um, the connections time to time and area. We have some, yeah. Now well, we Ireland is a special way. Like, <laughs> it's like doing <laughs> Okay. I, now we don't hear you. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now or? Yeah, yeah, now you Ah, can. sorry. Now, no. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, maybe I will give in the meantime. Yeah, okay. okay, in the meantime, I will give mm -hmm. the floor to Ted because actually, so maybe you can explain us with uh, how you're organizing with other organizations. And also we have a question from the audience that um, is like, how, uh, what are your goals for the future? And if you are inside of the Democratic Party, are you fighting for the left, let's say, because it's not that left. <laughs> so <laughs> these two questions. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, for the first thing about um, about different groups, um, I mean, Hannah, Hannah brought it up a bit, but we've been working pretty closely with the, uh, the Lincoln International Group. They've been, um, they've been like super helpful throughout our, uh, our kind of transition from the, the Bernie group to, to the DSA. Um, we were, you know, we also did a, a panel with them right before the November election, sort of talking about like how socialists would vote in the election and the different perspectives on that. Um, but for for other groups we work with, um, there's a movement now in Berlin called um, Deutsche Wohnen und Co. Enteignen, which means uh, it's the name of like a big uh, property company. It, uh, and it's a move. It's a movement to expropriate some of the largest uh, companies that own thousands of flats in the city and put them into public ownership. And so that's a group that a lot of people are excited about. And, you know, we have uh, some of our members that are also campaigning with them. And then we kind of shared their information and getting, um, you know, a lot of our, our members speak both uh, German and English and are translators. So can actually work for them translating materials to try to, um, you know, to try to increase the, the visibility of, of that movement, you know, even though we're, we're separate groups and everything, but people still, um, just as a concrete example of the sort of bridge building you can do, right, of, of actually getting, you know, manpower and skills um, and woman power um, involved in in a different group like that. We also have people involved with like, the, the Green New Deal for Europe, the Progressive International, um, the Tech Workers Coalition. And so, again, I think, you know, it's it's useful to have these connections from the different groups because, say, you know, you're a you're an American that moves to Berlin to work for some tech company or whatever. Um, and, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily know that there's the tech workers coalition going on, but uh, you know, you've heard of DSA and you get involved with that. And then it's, a, it's a way to get involved in something that then, then benefits you um, or, you know, it suits your, your ideals and your goals. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we're, I guess that's a bit of a laundry list, but yeah, those are all, um, all things that we're doing. And like I said, we really want to keep keep those connections going in addition to the sort of movements and the, the demonstrations and so on. Um, and yeah, in terms of goals um, as a group and the relationship to the Democratic Party, like we're we're not at all a part of the, the Democratic Party. I mean, you know, naturally 
to do electoral work in the U.S. with having a kind of first past the post system where third parties are pretty much not viable um, does require some trying to work with or against the uh, like slightly more left party, which would be the, the Democrats, of course. Um, that being said, like DSA as a national organization takes an explicitly like inside out perspective where it's not they're not a faction of the Democratic Party. They're not they're not just trying to work within the party. They're trying to, you know, win key races and win primaries in order to gain power, but also tied to social movements and, and tied to tied to kind of a broader vision of not just viewing the Democratic Party as the only vehicle for change um, in the US. So yeah, I mean, that, that leads sort of back to, to where we started, I guess, in terms of um, doing both the electoral work of trying to win where you can, um, getting, you know, getting key seats for progressives and, and socialists, um, but also staying tied to, to local social movements um, and, and trying, trying to build a, a movement outside of the party as well. Thank you, Ted. So um, now I'm raising questions from the audience. Um, I would like uh, to ask uh, to Salka because they were asking about the last um, tweets from uh, Trump on the Western Sahara. So maybe you want to say something about this? Yeah, of course. Well, in addition of it being wrong, uh, Trump's statement is not in accordance with the international law or with the traditional position of um, the United States at the Security Council or at the UN level and will for sure bring um, serious consequences uh, to an instability to the region. In addition, to, it puts the new, the new American administration uh, into more, uh, brings more problems to them in, in, serious, uh, in uh, serious difficulties. And we hope that uh, the new administration will be able to correct this error in in the history of international relations since Morocco is uh, an occupying power and, and, and it's using um, its force to continue to be the occupying power. And as um, former Secretary of State James Baker and Christopher Ross, former, former um, UN Security uh, General's personal envoy and Western Sahara, and many others, they have uh, said that this decision of trans, uh, Trump's administration is that it's basically given what is not theirs to someone that doesn't deserve it. So it's a it's a wrong move for Trump to do it, but it's a it's a, it doesn't change anything for the Sahrawi movement of liberation. It doesn't change. Not for us, not for the Americans that support uh, peace in the region and the self-determination for the Sahrawi people. It's uh, it's basically not. It, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't change the struggle. It doesn't change the 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 plans or the 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 fighting that continues in occupied Western Sahara. And obviously, it's 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 not. Um, it's not a, it's not definite uh, decision yet. It has to pass by Congress, and it has to be decided if if the U.S. will continue forward with it. Until then, it it means nothing, and exactly the same as everything Trump has done, it means nothing. Thank you, thank you, Salka. Um, we have a question from the audience. It's a general one, but um, maybe as I cut before uh, to Nerea, I will give to her the, the floor. So it's, um, uh, if it's possible to create an international network of activists and members of parties beyond the more official structures like the party of the European left or the Foro de Sao Paulo, and if so, how? So maybe Nerea, as you were talking actually a bit about this, you can reply and link to what you were saying before. Sorry that I cut you before. <laughs> no, it's grand. It's just like, I'm, I'm so sorry, but in Ireland, the internet is not working really well. I don't know if you can hear me now. You are frozen a bit, but I think it's fine. You go and back. <laughs> if you don't move that Wait, much, maybe it, it's fine. It, turn it, like just my, my camera. No. Yeah. Okay. Um. 
Okay. Maybe you can hear me now properly? Yeah, yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So, um, sorry about it. Uh, yeah, we were saying, I was, I was saying, you know, I, I think what it's important is just like keep connected with our local grassroots movements as well in the countries we live in and maybe an idea to, to like to get more people involved it will be like, like this kind of events because like that's a, a way to get to know us and, and uh, to build another link between us and maybe like there's a few events in summer like the summer comes the lefty summer comes when it's a really great idea to to keep connected members for different movements international lefties and so that's kind of when we are like in our countries and resident countries just like to keep connected uh, uh, between us and uh, doing these international events, just to, to get to know each other. And I don't know, I don't know if that was the question, like. Yeah, we have some connection problems as well, so it's a bit difficult to follow, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> So I will jump into the next comment. That actually is a Hi, nice comment. Uh, yeah, but it comes and goes, so it's a bit. Uh, um, we cannot properly hear you, Nerea. So it's a bit difficult to follow the the, the <laughs> when you take the floor. Mm. So I'm going to raise a comment that is really nice comment actually because it's. Uh, uh, he, he, someone in the chat said that he's a member of the Democratic Socialists of America and he's an organizer in Paris. And actually, he would like to connect with the group uh, that is existing in France. And also, he wants to show uh, the solidarity with the uh, Equatorians and Latin people. So, Ted, you have some people in France that would like to connect, but you can uh, find the comment in our Facebook. Uh, live stream so you will find information over there um, i would just wanted to say yeah if you yeah. um for anyone that wants to to share their contact information probably the easiest way to do that if you just go on our um our twitter it's at berlin dsa and the pinned tweet there is the is the sign up sheet i um, mean then you can put in your you know it has a, the, what country you're in and then we can put you in contact with the people we know in, in any given country so mm -hmm. um, and yeah thank, thanks for reaching out to who made that mm -hmm. call um, I have a general question, maybe, I don't know, maybe, Hannah, you can reply to this. Um, it's like, how do you recruit people? So how do you connect with people when, like, there is no a major event and how you are building up uh, your membership? Um, well, we just go to a lot of things. Um, <laughs> so there are a few of us that are very much involved in the group and we by being both members of other activist groups but also just by being uh, around in the scene i guess going to demonstrations going to panels meeting people that's kind of we just talk to them about it and then kind of find out what it is that people want it kind of ties back to this question that i think you asked us now about how to work outside of these party structures it's um you know we we are supported by the party but we we don't really have to we don't have to do what the party tells us to do. So we kind of we kind of try to be a bridge between the kind of social movements and activist groups within Berlin and also the what the party is looking at at this point. Like the party is quite involved with social movements in Berlin, but they are not as good at reaching to migrant groups. And I guess this is kind of gap that we try to bridge and how we um how we are net I mean how we're networking. I guess we just we really just try to talk to people as much as possible when whenever you the more you kind of go to things, the more you speak at demonstrations or speak at panels or meet people through various means, then the, the network just kind of grows and you end up 
just knowing more people. And we actually also want to facilitate that, facilitate that more in the next year. It's an idea that um, um, uh, we've come up with recently in that this in this kind of time because first of all, there's no such thing as no major events in Berlin because there is something big happening in Berlin. Uh, every week i would say there's a, always a demonstration that is significant in some way so have so there's always somewhere to go in that in that respect but what um an idea that we've had for the next year especially come out of this very online year that we've had is that we want to facilitate these meetings a bit um just kind of networking a bit more in a much more informal setting so what we've always done until now is had open kind of organizing meetings every month that anybody can come to but it's quite difficult to join a group when you come to a meeting when you're discussing ideas that have been kind of ongoing. So what we're going to do from whenever we're allowed to meet again is to have kind of a hopefully monthly, um, it's called a KUFA in German, it kind of a, a pay what you want uh, kind of event with food and drinks where people can kind of come together and just kind of meet each other. And we'll, the plan is to kind of theme them every month so that we're encouraging people who are interested, I don't know, say in anti-fascist work in Berlin or uh, queer feminist work in Berlin or women's rights or LGBT rights and kind of encourage people to come together and meet and exchange in that way. Um, because I guess for us, it's um, it's important to bring these things together. And we know that we now have uh, quite a good platform. And in the last year, we've done a lot of events that have connected a lot of people. So we're kind of trying to build on this as much as possible. And we're getting a few people contact us every week to try and get involved and find ways that they can get involved. We also have, you know, we, uh, quite a few of us were also, I mean, you know, they are involved and we're kind of helpful in setting up um, that English language group of the tenants movement that Ted was talking about, um, of the expropriation movement. I mean, um, and uh, yeah, so we, this is kind of we're trying to find practical ways of doing this because um, I think there's there's been kind of this missing element of community in the last year because everything has been so online and while you meet people it's not quite the same so I think we're going to try and make this more and more of a thing because we found that for example our summer camp um, was really successful last year because I guess we had so many people there and I know a lot of people made connections and since then new ideas have come up and uh, have actually already happened or are in development. So I think um, we're trying, to, we're basically trying to bring people more and more together. And we also have an increasingly coherent, active group that is also very keen for this. So I, so we're hoping that it will continue this way. And and what about the you, Jorge, uh, in the Movimiento Ciudadano? Um. We uh, we work with the Ecuadorian organizations, migrant organizations, mainly Ecuadorian ones, and um, also through the unions, um, um, and also um, we used to we used to do uh, many uh, live events like sports events, women's events. We we usually had these um, fixed dates um, every year to organize events for migrants, for women. And I would like to say that most of our voters, Ecuadorian voters, are women here in in Europe. It is like 60, 60 to forty percent. So um, we've been working. Um, uh, much uh, of women's issues like all th all those you you mentioned like women's rights and um, supporting women in different areas and also with um projects like uh, for example in spain um we create to this program to um to support those ones uh, who uh, who were evicted from the, from their homes uh, when there was this uh, economical crisis so um, we work with them in in Italy, for example. Um, there was an issue with families and uh, and minors who were separated from their families because of different social issues. So we created this support for them, for those families, to give them um, uh, legal legal support, social support, uh, diplomatic support as well. So we we we. We build this kind of um, th this kind of networks um, in social issues with people and engaging with them in those issues. Thank you for for mentioning this. Um, I have a question for for Salka. Um, wait a second. I need to find the 
um, wait, <laughs> uh, here. So are there any other options for the Sahrawi people besides the UN approved action or war? I don't see any. We mm. have been waiting for the peaceful resolution from the UN um, UN's promise in 1991, and we have been, as as I mentioned early, 29 years of waiting for that peaceful resolution, and it didn't come. Now that war is started again, I don't see any any way of backing up from war until we fulfill the the wish of the Sahrawi people, which is freedom and independence of Western Sahara. It's a, as I mentioned earlier, it's not a war that we went looking for, and we have been peaceful for 29 years, but it's uh, time to resume the arms and uh, fight until the last, last inch of Western Sahara is free. Thank you. You couldn't say better because it's like that, the situation right now. So um, the, uh, let me go to another question. Um, so Jaime, our friend Jaime is saying, uh, focusing on elections in Spain, in at least in two elections, 2015 and 16, the vote among the people living abroad was clearly more leftist among the people that are living, for instance, abroad uh, of Spain. So is this happening in Ecuador or in the United States? And if so, why? Uh, maybe Jorge, you can reply, and then Ted, you explained a bit this before, saying that people living abroad of US, they are more progressive, but you can go. So Jorge, please, go ahead. Um, well, um, we we have this, um, the electoral the electoral system uh, they allow to to you know to register to vote, but it's not it's not compulsory in in um, abroad but in Ecuador is compulsory so um, it's voluntary so you can you can you can vote no so but in the last in the last um, in the last election we had this um, uh, it has increased every year even though we have thousands of, of voters in, in, in Europe but because it's voluntary many many don't, don't want to do it but um, we are engaging in them to to register and vote. Yeah, but the question was if you were seeing that the um, people living abroad is more lefty, let's say, than the ones living in the country. Um, well, um, I would say yes because um, after this, uh, after the um, uh, citizens' revolution, uh, we created this this group and they they support us. So last election we won around uh, sixty percent in Europe. With uh, with our movement, so I would say it's more yeah it's, it's more left even in the US because we won the law the la, the the two uh, the two member of of the assembly. So in the US and Europe, yes, it's more left. Okay. okay. Uh, so Ted, what about the uh, US? Yeah, um, absolutely, um, definitely, definitely a much more left-leaning group. Um, in 2016, I believe it was 69% of the vote went for Bernie in the two-way race. This year, um, it was 58% went for Bernie in a five-way race. So, um, yeah, like a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty disproportionate um, enthusiasm for for left-wing policies. Um, and I think you know, there's there's probably a couple different reasons for that. One the people that uh, that leave the U.S. in the first place were probably a bit selected for a more um, discontentful bunch that, that sort of see problems with the U.S. and might want to go to places with better sort of social policies or uh, or education and so on. Um, and also, I think that you know, there's an effect that kind of makes you a bit more progressive or leftist um, living abroad from America. I think I think maybe particularly in like Western Europe where there's some more public goods um, where you see, you know, you, you grow up in the US and you're always told, oh, it's crazy. Like, oh, these, you know, communists want to have, you know, give you health care or something. Uh, or, you know, we could never afford education. It's not possible. And then, you know, living in Germany, which has had, you know, right wing government for almost 20 years now. Um, yeah, well, even before that, it just wasn't the conservatives. But, um, you know, they, they still manage to have a reasonable training network and free education and, and healthcare isn't too punishingly expensive. So it kind of makes you realize like, wait, this isn't 
insane stuff that I want. Like countries can do this. And so it makes the kind of demands that would be labeled socialist in America seem very middle of the road, very commonsensical. I think, I think that's one reason for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's why it is important um, as much as, you know, we don't want to fixate on electoralism. It is important then to, to try to harness that, that power and, and the, just the, the numbers of people abroad with the, with those kind of views. Okay, thank you, Ted. So one more uh, question uh, for Salka, and then I will give you like the golden minute uh, to close a bit the panel. So Salka, I have a question from you from the audience. It says, how do you see the relation between the European Union and Morocco regarding the cause of Western Sahara? Do you think migration politics of the EU can de facto produce an EU-Morocco alliance against the Western Sahara? Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the relationship between the EU and um, Morocco is strict. And even when it comes to Western Sahara, the European Court of Justice have uh, said twice that uh, none of the agreements between the European Union and uh, Morocco should include the territory of Western Sahara since it's not um, it's not independence. And until the Sahrawi people can decide um, on their future and can be in their land, there will they can't uh, include the the territory of Western Sahara in any agreement, economic agreements between the occupying uh, party, the Morocco or and the UN. Uh, I mean, uh, in the Europe. So it's uh, it's clear that every time uh, Morocco, uh, any European country or the European Parliament mentions everything in uh, an opposite note uh, on Western Sahara. The Moroccan uh, Moroccan government decides to do all the illegal to let the illegal uh, illegal immigration enter uh, Ceuta or Canar uh, the Canary Islands or the southern border of uh, Spain, and uh, it's not only illegal immigration; it's also the 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 illegal uh, contraband, and of course um, the EU's. Um, uh, rules on immigration affect uh, the cons affect uh, the Western Sahara because if if they were a little bit um, less harsh on people coming into Europe and uh, actually making it uh, the immigra uh, immigration uh, easier to the people coming from Africa, as they make it easier for uh, European companies to go and explode natural resources in Africa. Um, we won't have this issue. We won't have Morocco um, uh, act, doing everything they do to stop uh, to stop European countries uh, in um, in any way they can when it comes to Western Sahara. So it's it's a nonstop struggle with them because it's uh, every time any European country mentions Western Sahara, the Moroccan Moroccan occupation makes them pay. In this way, it's using the illegal immigration and using uh, immigration in general as um, as a tool to stop the Europeans to talk about Western Sahara. It's really the same. It's really for all the the people that is is the really same. So now I'm moving to the golden minute. Nerea, maybe she will have two golden minutes as she was <laughs> having problems with the airline. Let's see. Uh, Nerea, take the floor, take two golden minutes and say the last words of this event. And then I will go around with the rest of you. Well, I'll, I'll try if this works i'm really really sorry and well i just like to to say um thank you for to be here with us today and i didn't know many of you and now i do so i would like to say if anything you think united left can help you and with our network or or politics in Spain, just like let us know because we will do as much as can. Like for example, Salca, if you need anything, like we are in different countries, you know, like Spanish government hadn't do anything or 
right with Saharawi people, but Spanish people are very uh, Saharawi people and we are like really close to you. So anything you need, uh, just ask. And and uh, as I say to to every of you today here, like we will be very happy to to keep this uh, comradeship we created today. And I just like us um, as like we know like this globalization world, like with the capitalism and the wildest neoliberalism, love to be uh, in charge of this world, like this globalized um, system we have, when foreign countries and companies from richest countries come and take our resources and our lands, our water, all workers, all people, so we're going to, to give it some headaches and uh, do a globalization of the left. And so we're also like, we need to get organized ourselves internationally without forgetting our local work but just like let's do that let's fight them as they're fighting us so, so just like keep uh, together and working together and keep building this internationalism what is really important as we have seen in other countries the elected government has been overthrown by the right we need a but we also need solidarity internationalism and as we know in Spain exactly what happened to the previous government we had and then now we have a government again after 80 years we're again in the government and we know like the right and the far right will try to overthrow our government so we will need this international help and aid and solidarity lefty so let's keep working in this direction and just like just take care of each other as comrades and colleagues in the in the left in the global left thanks a million for being here today thank you Nerea now it has worked and it has worked so well thank you for that words I think it's really summing up a bit <laughs> yes uh, what we have all saying along the event so now I will give the floor to Hannah for instance yeah sure um I think maybe I'll go a bit more practical in that um G Link Internationals the left internationals is on all the social medias so you can follow us on that. I think we are left Berlin on most of them, but you can just look it up. I think, um, and I think we can post the link in on the conversation under the live thing on Facebook. Um, we do like for those in Berlin, um, we do a weekly newsletter, uh, kind of summarizing what's going on in Berlin at that time, summarizing German new or news from Germany in English, and also having a campaign of the week, kind of showcasing one campaign or group that is currently work that we're currently working with are currently in touch with um, to kind of give them more publicity. Um, so you can sign up to our newsletter that comes out every week. Um, we also, for those in Berlin, have our kickoff meeting for Plans for 2021 on the 12th of January. So we invite everybody to register to come to that. You can, um, we will try into a hybrid format where you can either be there in person or online, with, um, which I'm sure we'll manage. Um, and on that meeting, we'll kind of solidify what we're going to be working on in the next year. We have a few ideas already, but we're always kind of always happy for people to come and with ideas and we can see what we can do. The, some other plans that we have uh, kind of in the pipeline are a social media day to kind of uh, help various activist groups in Berlin to work on the social media and work on strategies and how to kind of work together on that because that's become very important in the last year. Um, we, we will try to launch the KUFA, the kind of uh, dinner the networking thing. Uh, we expect probably in March, unless we're allowed out earlier, but that is probably quite unlikely. Um, we also, in at some point in the summer, we'll have our summer camp again, but all of that, you know, if you have, if you have us on social media or sign up to our newsletter, you will find out about all of these things. But we very much invite everybody to come to the meeting. Um, and for those not in Berlin, it is also very possible to become involved with the website. You can, if you, we always looking for people to edit or translate, or you can pitch articles, or um, there's a lot of ways you can get involved, and you don't have to be in Berlin for that because I believe the editorial team meet online. 
Um, and uh, yeah, and I think we, I don't know, kind of echoing what Nerea said is that for us, international solidarity is obviously the key to what we're doing. And uh, we want to, we know that the right is very well connected. They work together and they have a lot of money behind them. And we don't necessarily have that, but we do have um, a lot of very engaged people who are doing great work and we're trying to bring them together. So I hope that, um, yeah, that continues and we can kind of keep growing our networks and working together on future campaigns. So I think that's that. That's my minute. That was absolute great. I mean, I'm highlighting the international solidarity as the key of this event and all the actions that we are um, carrying on together. Uh, now, uh, Jorge, your golden minute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I would like. To, uh, well, I, I do agree with um, creating this international network. However, it's um, because there are so many um, organisations uh, everywhere. It's it's very difficult to gather them together, and um, this is um, this is a very good uh, chance uh, today to to know the organisation. At least for me, that they are um, they, they they exist. So um, it would be great you know, to keep. Um, um, gathering together and organizing um, more events um especially with um with the group in in the us which is new for me and uh, in germany as well so um i would like to i would like to keep in touch i mean uh, if, if we can um talk more and uh, and see if we can uh, you know uh, create more links or stronger links uh, between us and also with uh, the spanish group as well um thank you very much yeah as i was saying at the beginning of the event this is just the first event event but we will organize i think more events of this kind in the future to keep the discussion going so um, ted maybe you want to take the floor now yeah absolutely um and yeah just to, to echo what, what jorge said yeah it's great to great to see um you know what people are doing all around the world you know we're sort of enmeshed in the the berlin scene but it's cool to know that there's other people living abroad still trying to stay active in their their country's politics um yeah so i guess you have some sort of pragmatic notes as well like it, um, i think i brought it up earlier but our uh, twitter is berlin dsa um so if you follow us there uh, you can get updates and um, fill out the form to subscribe to the newsletter and join the group and we have our monthly meetings on the first Thursday of every month um, in the evening. And that's where we discuss, you know, um, discuss what's going, events that are going to um, be going on, you know, organizational stuff, typical. Um, next year, mid-January, we'll um, be starting a reading group, um, probably, a, probably a couple different topics, but I'll be leading a group of, um, sort of looking at a like politics and history, there'll be some more people working on more uh, theory and then racial justice readings. And so we're gonna try to cover cover a few different topics with different different people kind of leading those. Um, like I said, we really want education to be an important part of what we do. And um, yeah, we're just, uh, you know, like I said, we're, we're a new group. It's a, it's a very kind of flat non-hierarchical group where we want people to, um, who have, you know, kind of initiative, want to get involved and do something can just sort of do that on their own and um, stuff sort of moves organically. So yeah, if you, you wanna get involved, uh, please do. There's no sort of like, uh, you know, approval process to do something you wanna do. I mean, it's really, it's a democratic group and it's all up to everyone's own initiative. So um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's all I have. And thanks again for, uh, for inviting us. Thanks to you for being us with, with us uh, this, this evening. Uh, actually, I wanted to make a comment that I didn't did it before, that when you were mentioning actually TED education and also Hannah was mentioning these reading groups, ourselves, the United Life as well, we are um, working a lot on education, training. And so I think it's also something that we are, all of our organizations are doing because raising awareness, promoting and educating people is one of our common as well goals, giving the, the people the means to think by themselves and to not uh, just, um, eat what they see you know in the media and just don't reflect on fake news as well or all the 
fake information that goes around, but think by yourself. So I think it's 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 quite nice to see that we are all on the same page, right? So <laughs> saying that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will give the golden minute now to um, Salka. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to make uh, make sure that to invite you all to um, to participate in it's a, just a um, social media exposure to the situation in Western Sahara to read more about it, raise awareness about what's going on. Uh, as I mentioned, the situation in Western Sahara is suffering a lot from uh, the media blockage, and uh, anything you could post or read about or just mention Western Sahara and social media will help a lot. And also um, just uh, just by uh, connecting with the local, your local um, organization and NGOs that you have pro-Western Saharan locals. Like for example, in Berlin, we have the, the, the Sahrawi diaspora in uh, Deutschland. Um, yeah, there, we are, as I mentioned, uh, we are everywhere and uh, just connect with your local Saharawis and uh, keep in touch. Thank you, Salka. It was a pleasure to give you the platform today uh, to 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 give the, the the bring the perspectives of the Western Sahara and and raise awareness of what is happening. So for us, it's a pleasure to share with you the screen and this evening, and we will keep going on and we will keep sharing information from our personal profiles and institutional profiles as far as it concerns United Life Abroad, at least. Thank I'm you. in charge of communication, so you can count on that. Thank you very much, and I thank you, uh, uh, United Left uh, in general. They have been uh, nothing but amazing to the Sahrawi cause, and we thank them everywhere. <laughs> We thank you as well. <laughs> uh, OK, so this is a wrap up. I would like to thank all the panelists, all the audience that follow us this afternoon. And I would like to say uh, one thing that uh, Nerea before was mentioning that uh, Maria Granate was saying, no, we are political orphans. But actually, today, this evening, we have seen that though maybe our politicians sometimes or governments, they don't think or sometimes reflect that much about the migrants or people living abroad. Uh, we are here, we are organizing ourselves and we keep the fight up. And uh, I think it's really important that we 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 keep going on and we keep talking to each other and developing this network, international solidarity network, as well as uh, Hannah was mentioning before. So thank you so much. Follow us on social media as well. If you don't need exterior on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, and have a lovely holidays for those who have it, uh, and see you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.